going to get started in about five, ten minutes. We're waiting on a couple of late arrivals. Everyone oh, have hello. coffee, tea, all that stuff. You Make go. yourselves comfortable. You. Restrooms, if you go out this door, they're immediately to the right. Do whatever you need to do. <laughs> Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. Are we so excited about Pollinator Talk today? Yeah. Yay. Me too. Um, so my name is Claire. I'm the general manager here at Garden 17. Um, I am also a licensed wildlife rehabilitator and a Texas master naturalist. So the natural world is one of my favorite things ever and just try to shut me up about it. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, Greg over here, he is our receiving manager. Um, he has been in the landscape business for years and years and years. Can answer pretty much any question you have about plants in general. Um, he is a wealth of information. So we will be hosting you all today. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just a reminder, this class is for y'all. So like I said earlier, restrooms are right outside to the right. Do what you need to do. If you need to stand up and kind of move around a little bit, totally get that too. It will not be distracting. Make yourselves comfortable. Okay? All right. So let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> kind of our overview. So we're going to start with a couple of things. Uh, first, we're going to start with really defining what a pollinator is. Um, we are also going to talk about pollinator food, host, and habitat plants. We're also going to talk about wildlife habitat and how to support all of our native natural beings in our in and around our houses. Okay. So definitions. What is a pollinator? A pollinator is going to be an insect or an animal. It could be birds. It could be mammals. It could really be anything that is moving pollen from one flower to the other. Um, Again, that could really be anything. Most of the time, pollination is an accidental byproduct of 
something feeding. So these plants have evolved to produce nectar to attract things that eat nectar that will also grab the pollen and go to another flower and pollinate. So pollination is really kind of an accidental thing, which is really interesting that this evolution has happened that way. I find it endlessly in, uh, fascinating. Um, so food plants. Um, food plants, they provide nectar to insects and animals. Um, host plants. Host plants are the plants that actually feed that juvenile larval stage, mostly of caterpillars. Um, host plants can be really species specific, so it's really important that we incorporate those. Um, habitat plants, so those are really, any plant that's not feeding or that's not a host plant, sometimes it is a food or a host plant, that is just a plant that is going to provide shelter or the basic materials to build a shelter for a variety of critters throughout our ecosystem. And I'm gonna talk a lot about sacrificial gardens because that is one of my favorite uh, workarounds when I'm having some um, issues with things that I may not want in my garden. So we're gonna go through that in yeah. detail later. Um, so when I'm talking about insects that also act as pollinators, so this little beetle, look at all that pollen. All of that that's shining on him is pollen. They may be going for bugs that are on the plant. They may be going for leaves that are on the plant. Either way, it is still being covered in pollen. It's going to go to another flower and then pollinate that other flower. Um, so we're not talking about just bees and butterflies here. We are talking about just about anything that moves that pollen from one place to another. Okay, so pollinator food plants. Like I said, this is something that's going to provide nectar and or pollen to insects, birds, and some mammals. Um, some of our mammals that tend to be really good pollinators, um, we have some native um, mice species that really like that sweet little taste of nectar. Um, so they are going to be kind of an accidental pollinator as well. Um, like you saw the beetles, um, they are great pollinators. And then of course we've got our bees, butterflies, moths, all of the, the, um, the normal gang of fun pollinators. Um, the shape of the flower. So depending on the shape of the flower, you're gonna attract different pollinators. Y'all doing okay? Oh, I think they're just getting one more. Okay, perfect. Um, so I have some examples up here of some different shaped flowers. Some of these are going to be very familiar to y'all. Some of y'all may be seeing these for the first time. Either way, they're all a lot of fun. So lantana, you can see how this flower is very kind of flat. It's a nice landing surface for butterflies. Butterflies are really attracted to these really nice flat flowers that they can easily land on. They're not great hoverers, and they are really too big to climb into the flower themselves. So having a landing pad for them is very, very helpful. Um, we then have this beautiful Mexican honeysuckle. I grew up with this plant. It is one of my favorite things ever. Sorry, but it, what makes it a landing pad for them? The shape, the shape. Yeah, so the question was what actually makes it a landing pad, and that is the shape of the flower. It's going to be more flat. I don't know if you can see it from back there, but it's going to be flat, a little bit bigger. That's going to make it really easy for that butterfly to land while it goes into those individual teeny tiny little flowers to get that nectar out. Then it's going to move on to another flower. It's got pollen on it because it just went after all that nectar, and it's going to then pollinate that next flower. Again, kind of accidental, but it still works. Totally. So the, the question was like other similar type shaped flowers. That's going to be verbena. We have a couple of them here. Um, I believe they're on that side. They're not quite in bloom yet. Um, but yeah, we've got several varieties of verbena on the floor right now. That is a great example of a great landing pad for these butterflies. Um, we also have Greg's mist flower, which is one of my favorite flowers ever. I don't know if all of y'all are familiar yet. It's not quite in bloom. We are still on the cusp, y'all. We're not quite in spring yet. I know it feels like it. We're almost there. Um, I know. Um, so when these bloom, they have just an amazing little like puff 
of flowers. Um, Greg's missed flower. Yeah, so, um, and I'm gonna have, I'm just gonna pass that around so y'all can all look at it. Um, that's also a great landing pad for those butterflies. Yeah, it is, um, and that's my next topic. <laughs> great, so the question was, is the Mexican honeysuckle native? It is one of our native uh, honeysuckle varieties. Um, my granddaddy used to pay me 25 cents a jar for honeysuckle nectar. I never got paid because I never filled up a jar because um, <laughs> I'm not an efficient pollinator. So <laughs> but these type flowers, you see how it's kind of a tube? These are great for hummingbirds. You're going to see hummingbirds just all over them. Um, the reason these are so good for hummingbirds and not really great for butterflies is because hummingbirds can hover. They don't necessarily have to have a landing pad in order to have access to that nectar. So anything that you're seeing tubular shaped, that's gonna be really great for those hummingbirds. Crossvine is another great Texas native. Um, these penstemon, you can see how these are pretty tubular shaped as well. This is another great native. Again, hummingbirds love these guys because they can hover safely without having to land. This guy's called a penstemon, P-E-N-S-T-E-M-O-N. -E yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we, have we see lots of varieties of penstemon here in Texas. Um, I can tell y'all, so last summer, everyone remembers how brutal last summer was. I gave up in my yard. I stopped watering, it just, it really just, I'm sure that all, a lot of y'all were kind of in the same boat. I can tell you my penstemon and my gora bloomed all summer without a drop of water from me. So penstemons, I will always buy penstemons. <laughs> I will always have them in my landscape. They really impressed me last year. Um, so and then a cone-shaped flower. So that can really be close to that tubular shape that we were talking about. Um, the salvia gregii, you can see how that's kind of tubular, but a cone as well. Um, this beautiful tacoma, you can see how this is not only tubular, but it is also a uh, cone-shaped flower. So these are not only going to be good for hummingbirds, little bumblebees, little bees love to climb all the way down in these bigger kind of conical flowers get all of that pollen all over them, get all of that nectar, and then they move on to the next one. Um, this is going to be, you wanna write it down, it's gonna be an Esperanza variety, and it's the Bells of Fire. We have several on the floor right now in yellow uh, colors as well. Um, can't go wrong with them, they are amazing. That was my question, does it matter if they're yellow or that? No, so, in speaking about color and how insects actually see, so their visible spectrum is very, very different than ours. They react to colors very different than we do. A bee may not necessarily see this as red. I don't really know what color they see it as. But that shape of the, the flower and the fact that it is a different color than the leaves is going to attract that pollinator to that plant. Um, so yeah, color doesn't matter necessarily. It's more variety. Um, what type of plant are you using? Um, we can see this little, this is a mountain laurel. This was actually on our floor last spring. That little bee butt sticking out and we've got a little ladybug down there that's doing some work, getting aphids and other pests out of there. Okay. So host plants, so we just talked about food plants. That's what's actually feeding the insects, animals, mammals, birds, whatever. Host plants are very different. So while they can still be considered a food plant, because more often than not, these are flowering plants that are producing nectar and pollen, these are different because they are actually supporting the larval stage of butterflies mostly. Um, the most common host plant connection that folks know is going to be the monarchs with the milkweed. Milkweed is the sole host plant for monarch butterflies. 
Um, what that means is the caterpillar stage, the larval stage, can eat nothing but milkweed. It will die without milkweed. Um, that is what a host plant is. We have some other examples. Um, so in the, the insect also lays their eggs directly onto those host plants so that when those eggs hatch into a caterpillar, the caterpillar's there, ready to eat, plants there, everybody's great. Um, so this guy, this is going to be our black swallowtail. This is actually on a dill plant. So this is the hardest word for me to say. Apiaceae family. So that's going to be fennel, dill, parsley. Those are all in the same family. Those are all host plants for the black swallowtail. Um, I hate fennel. I love dill. So part of my sacrificial garden is a ton of fennel where I literally take these caterpillars off of my dill that I want to eat and I put them on my fennel that I don't really care about, that I'm literally just planting to support my pollinators. Um, they'll eat parsley. So if you don't like parsley, grab a bunch of parsley, pull them off your dill, put them there. If you like fennel, whatever. You can really have some fun with this. Um, again, monarchs, they rely solely on milkweed. Um, and then passion vine is the sole host plant for our Gulf fritillary caterpillar. Um, they look really intimidating and intense. They aren't. They're really cute and a little bit spiny. Um, one thing to really note about host plants, these guys have evolved with these insects and our native ecosystem. It is not uncommon or unexpected for a caterpillar to completely eat a host plant right down to the ground. That host plant is fine. It's evolved to be eaten down to the ground and come back up from a healthy root system. So don't panic if you've got a bunch of butterflies and all of a sudden you don't have any plants left. That plant, as long as it's a native plant, it has adapted to come back from that because this is kind of a symbiotic relationship. Um, I love these guys. And then the monarch caterpillar I think is so fun. Okay, so let's talk about some habitat plants. So habitat plants can really be a mix of kind of everything. It could be a food plant, it could be a host plant, it could be a completely non-flowering plant. Habitat plants are really just there to provide shelter for these critters. It could be a hole in a tree for this little raccoon family. Um, it could be the twigs and the small branches that this mockingbird has used to make their nest. Um, or it could simply just be a substrate. This is a, a pipe vine swallowtail chrysalis. Um, you can see how it is tacked here at the bottom and then it has this little string that's also tacking it to there. That would be considered a habitat plant because it is providing support for that animal to develop and grow on. Does that, does that make sense? Um, it could be grass blades. We've got lots of birds that will literally go out and cut little pieces of grass blades to weave in their nests. Cottontails, um, we have hundreds of native rodents that use grasses for, for nesting specifically. It could also be the mop that you left outside and the squirrels have decided to raid that and build their nest out of it. It's very soft, it's cotton, I get it. Their little babies need a soft little bed too. Um, but habitat plants are just as important as those food and those host plants. Everything that's living needs three basic things, us, critters, everything. We need food, we need water, we need shelter. You can't live without any of those things, without all of those things. Pollinators, insects, wildlife is just the same. They're just trying to make it. Um, so by providing a well-rounded um, habitat for them, a really natural ecosystem that has all of those things in it, you're gonna have such a wonderfully diverse yard and garden, and diversity is key. Um, one thing about, I'm gonna jump back to host plants real fast. Because they are so specialized, that can be really, really dangerous. Any 
organism that specializes to the point where they rely solely on another organism to survive and produce offspring is a really dangerous game to play. We are seeing that all over the place. Monarchs are the easiest example that I can give everybody. Um, we used to be part of a prairie, prairie system that stretched all the way to Chicago and to Illinois. That prairie system is absolutely fractured. Um, this is why the monarchs are having a really hard time. Instead of being able to just kind of traverse this line of native plants and native habitat and food, now they're having to hop so far between these little pockets that it's making it really hard. Um, pocket prairies are so much fun. If you have a spot in your yard that you just don't want to deal with, plant some native seeds in there, plant some native grass seeds in there, make a little pocket prairie. That's going to help literally every pollinator you could ever think of. Um, and it's just important for our ecosystem. Um, prairie systems are really diverse. That's a whole nother class. Did you have a question? No? You just holding your hand up? Okay. I have a question. Yes, absolutely. So your comment on it, not, not specifying one animal so much. So is there an issue with maybe attacking just monarchs or is it diverse regarding our diversity? Sure. So that question, if any if everybody didn't hear, that was should we diversify what we're trying to attract in our yards? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, okay. Absolutely, diversify. Um, just like specializ specialization can be really dangerous, monoculture can be just as dangerous. If we are just trying to attract this one insect, if you lose, if something wipes out that host plant, you now have nothing left. You don't have food plants anymore, you don't have habitat plants anymore, and you don't have those host plants. So that is definitely going to impact your pollinators in your specific space. Um, diversity is the key here. Just like we talked about flower shapes, it's really important to have all of those different flower shapes in your yard so that you can attract all of these guys. Um, host plants are hard because it is a specialization and you do have to have this very specific plant. I buy in mass um, and I split it up throughout my yard so that if I'm having an issue with maybe one of my front garden beds and all of a sudden all my milkweed is gone, I kind of have a backup in another place where maybe that milkweed isn't affected yet. My sacrificial garden is full of milkweed and it just kind of does whatever it does and I don't pay attention to it and it comes back every year. Um, but yeah, so diversity is, is key, but we also have to work within the constraints of the animal itself. You know what I mean? So it can be really tricky. So I just say buy all the flowering things, plant them all, and you're gonna get a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> That's kind of what I do. I plant what I like, and nine times out of 10, it is benefiting my immediate ecosystem more than I even know. Um, does that help answer? Great. Okay, so water sources. Again, remember, we need food, we need water, and we need shelter. So I have a couple of examples here. Um, I have three different levels of water sources at my house. I have, I use these glazed saucers as on ground water sources. Um, they lay right on the ground. I rinse them out in the heat of the summer, probably every day if I'm out there, every other day if I'm not out there, just happen to be out there. Um, really important, this is really gonna be more for our ground dwelling wildlife. Insects can really get to anything, it doesn't matter what height, but remember diversity, we don't just want insects, we also want to attract our other native wildlife because they do jobs that a lot of people don't really realize. Um, if you're seeing skunks and armadillos, you don't have a skunk and an armadillo problem, you have a grub problem, you know? So they are actually doing you a favor by eating all of those grubs in your yard that are eating your plant roots. I have an armadillo that lives in my yard. His name is Arnie. Um, <laughs> he's been there for about five years. He just kind of comes out every once in a while. Never once have I had any damage from him. Most of the time I go out in the morning and I can see his little 
digging trail literally goes like right around the stuff that I have planted. He doesn't care about my plants. He doesn't want my plants. He wants the grubs that want to kill my plants. Do you? what I can do. So I don't know if everybody heard that, but a lot of people do have this misunderstanding about armadillos. Um, they are so associated with Texas. Everyone loves armadillos until they're in their yard. And I find that very unfortunate because they are fascinating creatures. Um, they have quadruplets every time. They, they have four identical babies with every single litter. Um, the armadillo parade if you are ever able to catch like a mama with her babies walking around it is just about the cutest thing in the world because they're pink when they come out like they are these tiny little pink things oh my god i can't even deal with it Sure, so that's going to be changing it out. Um, so mosquitoes will go from egg to larva to adult in about 48 hours. So as long as you're changing that water source out every other day or so, you should be good. Um, you could also start exploring fountains. Water, with water moving, that's going to help prevent some of the mosquito buildup. It won't eliminate it, but it'll slow it down because they, they want really still water to lay their eggs in. So if it's moving, that's going to cause them more problem. They may find another place because it's just too tricky. Um, but honestly, as long as you're dumping these out and refilling every other day, I've never had a problem with mosquitoes breeding in my water sources like this. But the pollinators would be exposed to moving water still? Yes. So, and that's why y'all see all these fun little rocks here. So um, I always put rock carns in my water sources. The reason being, if a little insect falls in here, I don't want loss of life there. I don't want that bee or that butterfly or that beetle to drown. I'm going to provide them little islands that they can climb up and escape from. Um, I would do that in moving water too. That way the insects can land on this little island, safely walk down to the water level drink until they're satiated, and then they can easily get out of there without potentially drowning. Um, so if you're looking into a fountain, I would definitely explore some of like getting these just so that you can get your pollinators out safely. Because um, again, we're trying to provide them with life supporting things. We don't want to in turn create some kind of obstacle that may cause them harm. We were talking about Sure. So <laughs> raccoons are part of just a diverse ecosystem. So they do a lot of digging. They eat a lot of rodents. Um, so they really help keep our rodent population under control. Um, they eat a lot of insects. A lot of the big grubs are one of their favorite things. Um, again, they're just trying to live. Um, you know, right now is baby season for wildlife across the board. Every single female either is pregnant or has babies right now. Um, so it's really important that we just keep that in mind. We'll talk after, I have some tips to like shore up your house and just, honestly with raccoons specifically, it really is maintenance. It's making sure that they can't get into the eaves, it's making sure that they can't get under decks, yeah. it's making sure that you are taking the proper precautions to keep them out of your space and providing them with another space to go to. Um, we'll get to sacrificial gardens in a, in a minute because that really does help too. Um, yes? So I honestly, so I have my flat saucers on the ground. Um, I have my regular bird bath about this height. Um, that's going to help with like birds and other flying insects can, that can get to it. And then I have another one that's about in between. Um, 
I think as long as you're providing those three different layers, you're gonna really be able to cater to whatever may be visiting your yard. Um, the puddling with butterflies, a lot of times they are getting micronutrients from the soil when they do that. So I don't know if anybody's seen that where you've got a puddle in your yard, you've got a bunch of butterflies just kind of landing and going to town. We have crazy clay soils. The one benefit about clay soil is that they are fairly nutrient rich. Um, so they're getting a lot of nutrients out of that clay soil. Not great for planting necessarily because of the drainage issue. You would want to amend that, but there are a lot of nutrients that are locked up in those clay soils that once they're puddled in water, that kind of releases them. Yeah, so butterflies are just getting some micronutrients from that when you see that, that action. So I wouldn't stop it. If you're seeing that, then it's, they're doing it for a very specific reason. Okay, so we talked about varying the height. Same thing that we need for survival, food, water, shelter. Sacrificial gardens. This is one of my favorite things ever, and it's one of my favorite tricks. Okay, so you've got a squirrel eating your tomatoes. What are you gonna do? I have a two-pronged effect with this. So with squirrels and tomatoes specifically, before my tomato starts putting out fruit, I'm going to find a rock the size of a mature fruit and paint it the color of that mature fruit. I am then going to put that painted rock at the bottom of that plant so that when that squirrel comes to investigate, they will say, hey, this isn't a tomato, this is a rock and I don't wanna eat it. Their little squirrel brains can't remember where they bury hundreds of pecans a year, but they will make that association that they tried to eat this thing and it was not edible. So they're going to move on. Um, that's my best trick with tomatoes. That's kind of my only trick with tomatoes, but it's my best trick. Sure. And that's going to affect, that's going to have different levels of effect. Um, again, animals, have different taste buds so what we associate with spicy may not actually be spicy to them um, if it's working for you by all means continue with it um, it may not be effective for all species though um, and if everyone didn't hear that that was asking about using cayenne for some repellents a lot of the um, manufactured repellents that's one of their main ingredients is some kind of pepper whether it's cayenne um, just some kind of capsaicin um, but again, that's really going to depend on the animal, the species individually, because they don't taste like we do. Um, I wouldn't be able to eat cayenne, like a mouthful of cayenne pepper, but a bird isn't going to care. You know what I mean? They're just, because they're not going to taste it the same way we do. Yeah, there are levels of detail that get it. Totally, totally. Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and again, if that's working for you, by all means, stick with it. If you find a method that works until it stops working, continue on with it. Um, my other huge trick, I've said it a couple of times, is a sacrificial garden. I buy three plants for me, I buy three plants for them. I chase things out of my garden, I do not chase them out of my sacrificial garden. They are allowed to do whatever they want there, I will continue to replace the plants as they get eaten down. Placement of your sacrificial garden is hugely important. So, wildlife is not going to go any further than they have to for resources. It is dangerous for them to be out in the open. Squirrels, everything wants to eat a squirrel. They're a prey animal, unfortunately. Cottontails, everything wants to eat a cottontail. So, if you have a spot in your yard that is like heavily treed, um, you see a lot of wildlife activity there, that's where I would put my, my sacrificial garden. My personal sacrificial garden is in the corner of my backyard. I've got five or six pecan trees there. I see all kinds of wildlife activity there. I've got my sacrificial garden in that spot so that that wildlife does not need to go any further than that to get their resources. That means they stay out of my garden. Um, I'm making it literally as easy as I can make it for them to get their resources without having to venture further to me. Does that kind of make sense? So again, if you're seeing, if you've got a corner of your yard, you've got a bunch of trees, you're seeing a lot of things um, kind of moving around, put that sacrificial garden there. 
Yep. Like Anything. Um, so really, so if I'm planting tomatoes, I'm going to plant three tomatoes for me. I'm going to put three tomatoes in my sacrificial garden. So pretty much anything that I'm having a problem with something kind of getting into, I'm going to start incorporating that into my sacrificial garden. That may change every season. You know, sometimes squirrels develop a taste for something that I haven't had a problem with before. If I'm seeing that they have, I'm just going to add that to my sacrificial garden and go from there. I don't even tend that thing. I just plant when I need to. Um, and it has saved me a lot of headache um, and a lot of frustration um, because, again, I know they're just trying to live. I know they're just starting to do things. I really want those cherry tomatoes too. So <laughs> I'm going to make it easy on myself by keeping my tomatoes separate from theirs. Sure. Yep. So that question was about bean plants. Um, same thing. If you're seeing that there's a problem, like you're having a really hard time getting these beans started, get additional, plant some for you, plant some for them. Chase them away from yours, leave theirs alone. They're smart enough to figure out that this garden may not be a safe place for resources, but this one over here is. Um, they are smart enough to know that. So if you're, again, if I was planting something that I hadn't planted before and all of a sudden I'm having a ton of issues with wildlife or whatever getting into it, that's going to trigger, hey, I need to add this to my sacrificial garden too. Sure. You learn something new every day. <laughs> so yeah, I would just really encourage you, like if you're getting, going to get a sacrificial garden established, go ahead i would start with the plants that you're having problems with right now um cut it off chase them away from your garden let them do whatever they want in theirs okay so again rule of thumb three plants for me three plants for them yes Sorry, just to clarify on your rock mix you put it out when the tomatoes are green or like before, before they even fruit i want them to learn that this plant is not edible regardless of what stage it is in that way, <laughs> I know, it's kind of mean, but it works. Um, that way, when that plant does start fruiting, the squirrels are less likely to go after it um, because they've tried it and it didn't work. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I would do it. As soon as I get those tomato plants in the ground, I'm out there painting rocks. My neighbors think I'm insane. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> 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 Maybe we should. Um, maybe we'll have a uh, tomato rock painting class. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just paint rocks like vegetables and go from there. Try to trick everything. Okay, so native plants. Why would we want to choose native plants? My biggest reason is that wildlife and our ecosystem in general has evolved with those native plants. Um, it's just so easy. Insects will instinctively know when to check a flower for a nectar refill on our native plants because they have evolved with them. It is, it is instinct. Flowers of all kinds have huge variations in how quickly they refill their nectar source. So let's say a butterfly came and drained this, this flower of all of its nectar. I'm not sure what the timeline is on this one specifically, but generally 12 to 24 hours is what it takes for a plant to refill its nectar source. Our native bees are going to know this plant takes about 12 hours to refill that nectar source. It's going to empty the nectar, it's gonna come back in 12 hours to check. It may not know that for non-natives because non-natives have not evolved for this area and have not evolved in conjunction with those insects. Um, we have there's an herb it's called borage um, I don't think we have any starts right now but we do have seeds and it starts amazingly from seed it refills its nectar source every like 15 minutes it is amazing it is constantly I have it all over the place at my house it is constantly covered with pollinators butterflies and bees borage b-o-r-a-g-e 
It gets fairly large once established. It's kind of like, it's like a leafy uh, green plant. You can eat it. It's a little bit peppery. Um, and then it has this beautiful bluish purple flower. Again, every 15 minutes. That's really pretty phenomenal. So these guys know that. They see that borage and they know that they can drain it of its nectar, go do some other things on some other plants and come back 15 minutes later and they have another uh, supply of nectar waiting for them. Really, really amazing. Also, non-natives, even if they stemmed from a native plant, are really developed for their looks, not necessarily their importance in a landscape. So when they're developed for looks, things like nectar production, pollen production, take a back seat. So this is another reason why native plants are really important. These guys are just fitting in with the environment. They're not bred for color. They're not bred for shape. They are strictly pollinator plants still. So when you're looking at Gerberas are my, my best example. They are beautiful flowers, um, but they have very little um, impact on any of our pollinators. They're beautiful, but they have been developed to be beautiful, not to be functional. Does that kind of make sense? So anytime you're just trying to go back and forth on a plant, go as close to the native mother plant as you can get, um, and that's gonna help with supporting that ecosystem. Does that kind of make sense? Great. Okay. Okay, y'all, I may be about to ruin your day. And I'm really, really sorry. Mosquitoes are pollinators. <laughs> I'm really, really sorry. Pardon? Oh, gotcha. Okay. I do love snakes. Um, okay. So, it's always hard to learn something redeeming about something that um, you may not have loved before learning the information. Um, so, the way mosquitoes kind of work, so the female is, is the uh, gender that needs blood. Um, there's a protein in blood that they can't make themselves that is required for egg production. So any mosquito that bites you that is a female, she's probably trying to make eggs and lay them somewhere. I am in no way encouraging anyone to intentionally breed mosquitoes. <laughs> I want to make that very clear. <laughs> Please do not breed mosquitoes. But every time I look at a mosquito, I think a little bit more in depth about that animal as an individual. Uh, males, their entire lives, nectar. I know. It's hard. It's so hard to hear. Um, <laughs> but the next time you see a mosquito, think about it. I know, I know, I see all your faces. I almost didn't put this in, but I wanted to. Um, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the products we have up here. So we've just talked about all of these flowering plants and how to attract all of this wildlife and support them and all of your pollinators. The only way that you can have a healthy plant and a healthy pollinator um, population is with healthy soil. It all starts there. So if you have healthy soil, you're gonna have a healthy plant, which is in turn going to support that population. Um, another thing that we really talk about a lot and we're getting into that time of year where fertilization is getting back on our radars. We kind of dropped that off during the dormant winter season, but we are seeing new growth on just about everything. Um, so fertilization is, is something that we need to start doing again. This maximum blooms down here, it is, so it doesn't say, it says outstanding liquid organic fertilizer for all flowers and anything that blooms. They are not lying. This stuff is magic. If you have a flower garden, I highly recommend starting getting to get this into your routine. 
Um, I have never had so much success with pluming until I started using this. Um, are you looking at the numbers? Okay, so um, let's do that real fast. So these numbers here, you'll see that on pretty much every fertilizer that you're ever looking at. That's gonna be our NPK ratio. They all work together to provide a healthy base for your plant, but they are kind of specifically doing one thing. Nitrogen, this first number, that's really gonna be for leafy growth. High nitrogen is great for like tropicals that you don't really care about flowers. You're growing them for the leaves anyway. Um, that's, if you're looking at a fertilizer that has that high nitrogen content, that's for like grass, again, tropical stuff that you don't really care about flowering. This middle number, the phosphorus number, that is what promotes blooming. That is what you want for blooming plants. You want a high uh, phosphorus number there in the middle. Um, Eight is a pretty high number. So it's gonna be the ratio. So when you're looking at all three numbers together, like this is three, eight, three, that eight is significantly higher than the nitrogen and the potassium, which means I'm gonna have quite a large effect on my bloomers, on my blooms themselves. Does that help? Okay. Um, the last number, that's gonna be our potassium number. That is for root development and internal strength of the plant. So that's like immunity. That's why on our liquid seaweed, it has zero, zero, and then I think 0.3, mm -hmm. 0.03 maybe. Um, that is really going to be geared towards getting those roots established. That's going to be geared towards giving that plant just a little immunity boost. I liken this to us taking vitamin C. It's not feeding us, it's not really doing much, but it's just making us a little internally stronger. So the question was if you would use this for new plants, every single plant. So in the heat of the summer, I apply this to my outside plants once a week. Um, in the winter, I may do once or twice a month, but this is the one thing that I do year round. Y'all, I am a lazy gardener. I will be the absolute first person to admit that. I'm gonna do as little as I can to get the effect I want. This is what allows me to do that because I'm making my plant stronger, which means I have to work less when problems arise. Does that kind of help? Yeah. Okay, I had a question about that uh, pollen um, material for you know, liquid. Sure. Directing all the plants, especially for things like um, monarchs. Sure. So you're never going to want to spray anything directly on a pollinator, whether it's pollinator safe or not. Um, butterflies and moths, especially because they have that really fine powdery on their wing, powder on their wings, you don't want to potentially damage that. Um, so if I'm going to apply some things outside, honestly, I'm going to take a lap real fast and see what activity I'm seeing. Um, it may be where like, hey, this is the time of day where I've got bees and butterflies all over in it, everything. I'm just gonna wait. Um, that's more specific to a foliar application where you're actually spraying it on the leaves. Liquids are really easy to do as a soil drench and then you're not worrying about anything. You're just diluting it in your watering can. I think these are two ounces per gallon of water. So you're just diluting and watering like normal, yep, around the root system. I personally prefer the soil drench. Um, foliar applications can be very, very effective, but they are very particular. So the underside of uh, plant leaves have these teeny tiny little pores. They are open in the morning and they start closing around 10 a.m. So that is those pores are what is actually going to internalize the product that you are spraying on them. If you're spraying, if you're doing a foliar application of liquid seaweed at six at night, you are just wasting product. Those pores aren't open anymore. You're not actually getting anything into that plant. Um, soil drench, on the other hand, can be done at any time because it's going straight to the roots and there's no time limit on that. Um, in the morning, like early dawn. So they're not open for a long time. Um, and that is going to vary somewhat between different species. There's always exceptions to every rule. So if you are doing an, a foliar application, really try to get it done before 10 a.m. Um, that's just kind of my rule. 
it's easy for me to do and it's a nice cutoff that I can stick to a little bit easier. Um, but again, we don't want to do it in the evening because we don't want you to waste product, you know? That's not fun and it can get really expensive. Um, the other thing that we are about, we haven't seen it yet, I know it's coming, non-beneficial insects, aphids, white flies, spider mites, mealybugs, all of the things. Um, especially when I'm pollinating, or when I'm planting for pollinators, I'm gonna use as little product as I possibly can. Even if it says it's pollinator safe, I'm still going to use extra caution when I know that I have a pollinator garden going. I use beneficial insects. So we have two on the floor right now. We have praying mantis, um, little praying mantis egg sacs. Um, these are super cute. I don't know if everyone can see those. They're just like these little egg sacs full of hundreds of little praying mantis bugs. So when you are ready to start doing the mantis specifically, what you're gonna do is you're gonna keep it refrigerated until you're ready to put them out. Then you're gonna put them on like a warm shaded spot. So a patio or something is really good. These have screens in the top so you can see when they start to hatch. As soon as you start to see activity in these cups, take them and put them out in your garden where you're having the problems. Highly predatory. These guys will, they will take care of a lot of problems for you. Mature mantis can also combat some grasshopper issues. Little baby mantis really aren't gonna do anything for a full-grown grasshopper, but a full-grown mantis, that grasshopper doesn't really stand a chance. Um, okay, so they'll eat the aphids, but they won't eat the caterpillars? So they're going to prefer aphids. Aphids are full of what we call honeydew. Um, <laughs> such a nice word for such, you know, <laughs> such a horrible thing. If nobody knows, honeydew is um, essentially aphid poop um, because they are sap suckers. Um, it's just a sugary, concentrated substance. That's appealing to a mantis. Um, so I, you may have some casualties as far as pollinators go. Honestly, the benefit that they bring far outweighs any casualties you would have. Same goes for lace wings. So green lace wings, I'm sure everyone has seen these. These are the bright green flying insects. Um, the larval stage of lace wings are highly predatory. Um, same thing, aphids, spider mites, mealybugs, all of those nice juicy sap suckers, they're gonna go crazy on. Um, these guys come in little pouches that you just like hang on your plants. So you can just kind of distribute these throughout, hang them on your plants, let them hatch, and they're going to eat everything they come into contact with as juveniles, then they will um, go through their instars and emerge as adults. Um, one of the easiest ways to take care of those uh, plant damaging insects. Um, and they're just really fun to watch really fun to watch. So my kind of rule of thumb when I, because this is my primary insect control, as soon as I have a container that's hatching, I'm immediately getting a new container to put back out. So I have a constant rotation of beneficial insects in my garden. I've already started putting them out. We just got them in this week. Nor If we ha were having a normal spring, which we're not, um, probably not f until the end of March. Um, I know it's coming. I want to have those beneficial insects in my garden before I have a problem. Does that kind of help? Okay. Whatever bug they can come across. More likely than not, you have a plant damaging insect in your garden somewhere that you just don't know about yet. That's just kind of how it works. That's another, um, I've always been told if something isn't eating your plants, you're not really part of a system. You gotta have the good and the bad. And unfortunately that can be really frustrating sometimes, but if all we are aiming for in gardening is good, you will always be disappointed. 
And if you're disappointed when you're gardening, what's the point? You know, this stuff should bring you joy. If it doesn't, let's have a talk and find a new hobby. So it's, it's, so the question was how the lace wings get out of this little bag. So at the top, it's kind of perforated. So you just kind of open it a little bit. Yeah, I'm not going to open this because I pulled it. Yep, they just crawl right out. Um, Oh, every, yeah. If you're going to buy one, I don't know. That's really hard to answer. So I, I buy both. This one would be easy to hang on. Absolutely. But then, I mean, it's just starting to get leaves. Sure. So I would just give the great, give the lace wings a try. Just hang them in your branches, um, let them emerge. Make sure, again, make sure that you're providing them the resources to stay. When you're releasing these beneficial insects, they're gonna need the same resources that your pollinators need. They need food, they need water, and they need shelter. As long as you are providing that, they have no reason to go other places. Again, even if you're not seeing plant damaging insects yet, I can guarantee there's some out there that these guys will find and will eat before there's a problem. Does that help? I would start with green lace wings because it's really handy to just hang up. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Trees are, especially when we're talking insects, trees are a great shelter. Insects can hide under leaves. Sure. Um, that's exactly what I would do. Most of my ground water uh, sources are going to be in shade. That's going to help with how often I'm having to clean them. That's also going to help, since we were talking about that earlier, um, that's also going to help with keeping the water cooler. If I'm having, you know, pretend this saucer was black, if this is sitting out in the hot sun, that water is going to heat up really, really quickly. Um, and in the summer, everything enjoys a little break in the shade. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. That's so cute. Provide some water. Oh, he would love a water source like this. Um, so again, this is for my, my terrestrial critters. It's not for my flying critters. This is for my critters that can't climb um, or have a really hard time climbing or could potentially hurt themselves trying to get into something like this. A frog would never try, I can't say that. A frog is unlikely to try to get to try to get to this thing or a toad, um, especially when you have a ground level one available. Much easier. Sure. Gotcha. And it's amazing. So um, I fire with fire, y'all. You got aphids. Get something in there that's going to eat them. Um, so unfortunately, because last year our summer was just so brutal, I have very large established crepe myrtles in my yard too. Every single crepe myrtle in town was covered with aphids. There was just no getting around it. There was It was a combination of moisture and dryness and all of the horrible things that could have happened just made a perfect storm for aphid. Yeah, mine, the ones that are in partial shade were the ones most affected. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And that could be ambient heat. It's hot. Even if it's not like baking right where you are, just the ambient heat is really hard. Yeah. I'll get right to you. Okay. <laughs> Ladybugs. Ladybugs. Okay. So we get this question a whole lot. <sighs> Ladybugs are also voracious predators. They will take care of aphids and all those other insects all at the same time. Buying ladybugs can be very, very problematic. There are a ton of, spe of uh, species in that family that look very similar. Um, um, that look really similar. So we kind of run the risk of potentially introducing a species that is not native here. And then we have a whole nother problem. 
that non-native species could easily outcompete our native species. Um, it could eat our native species. It could do a lot of damage. Um, so we, we don't stock ladybugs because we don't want to run the risk of introducing something that shouldn't be here. But you can attract ladybugs to your yard. Um, they are going to be attracted to, uh, again, resources, water, food, shelter. If you can make sure that those are available, and I bet you anything, if you have some kind of infestation happening, if you look real close, you've already got ladybugs that have found them and are starting to do some work on them. Um, so yeah, ladybugs, I would love to sell all of y'all ladybugs today. I think they're amazing. But again, the potential risks far outweigh the benefit. And with the mantis and the lace wings, these are native species. I'm not introducing anything that shouldn't be here. Um, yeah. Sure. So the question was birds and pest control. Um, they're not going to really do anything for aphids, spider mites, or mealies. Um, mockingbirds, blue jays, anything in the corvid family, crows, ravens, all of that stuff, they will go after those bigger bugs. So grasshoppers, crickets, stuff like that. Um, honestly, a bird going after an aphid colony is not worth the effort for that bird. They're never gonna get enough to eat from teeny tiny insects to make it worth the energy expent, spent to try and eat them. Does that kind of make sense? So birds are a great thing to attract to your garden though. Um, native grasses are going to be, be the best thing to attract birds to your, to your ecosystem. They're gonna eat the seed heads. Um, they're gonna use the blades for <coughs> nesting. Um, birds are a really great way to, again, establish those more native prairie plants that we're missing now. Um, yeah, pocket prairies, if you ever go, oh my gosh, what's it called? Commons Ford, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Um, it's a restored prairie, it's up off 360, is that right? I haven't been there in a long time. <laughs> Bee caves, okay. So it's out in kind of the Balcones Canyon lands area, um, but it is a fully restored prairie system. I encourage y'all all to go out there and take a hike before it gets too hot. Commons Ford. Yeah, it's yeah. somewhere west. <laughs> it's <laughs> absolutely beautiful. Um, but that is one of the best examples that I can think of that you can actually see a prairie system in use. Um, I have never seen as many birds as I have seen there. And I live really close to Hornsby Bend. Like, I live really close to Decker Lake. So I've got a lot of birds in my area. Never have I seen so many native songbirds as I did at Commons Ford. Really amazing. We have dozens of species of native sparrows that you really only see in situations like that where there is an established native ecosystem. Yeah, I'm glad that you've been there. <laughs> Most people look at like me like I'm crazy when I bring that up, yeah. Oh, gotcha, okay. Yeah, yeah, so go. Everyone take a field trip to Commons Ford um, and admire the prairie. It's just beautiful, grasses and everything. Sure. For hummingbirds, so um, any kind of honeysuckle, uh, the with the exception of the Mexican honeysuckle, that does tend to be more of a bush form. The coral honeysuckle would be great. Crossvine would be great because um, remember we're looking for those tube-shaped flowers for those hummingbirds. Honestly, I've seen hummingbirds on my passion vine before, so it's not strictly tube-shaped flowers. Um, I've seen them on a lot of plants that I didn't necessarily expect them to, s to see them on. Um, but for vines, yeah, cross vine is great. Any hu vining honeysuckle is gonna be great. Um, I love coral honeysuckle, like you had said, is always a good one. 
Um, mainly what I like to do, uh, if given the space, is having a couple different varieties. Um, and that really helps cover uh, the timing of developing the ecosystem in your whole landscape. So I, I focus on something that's like an early bloomer, which is mm -hmm. the trumpet vine. Um, it puts its biggest show on right about now. We actually have a beautiful specimen climbing up our pergola out there. Um, and that's a big show. It'll get them in. It's almost like I say a neon sign for <laughs> pollinators. Um, and then I always like to follow that up with some stuff like passion vine mm -hmm. uh, that might extend that bloom life. So when that trumpet uh, vine is done with its big spring show, maybe that's when you start seeing um, some of the oh, Arabian jasmines or the passion flowers or then in the winter time, you have like the white, Greg's white mist mm -hmm. flower that comes in. So really something that spans all seasons helps, um, but I do like to punctuate the seasons with something that is just a huge spring bloomer, like a star jasmine, for instance. Um, like Claire had mentioned with kind of the, the memory and developing that ecosystem where all of these pollinators want to come in to your space. If you can entice them first thing in the spring, uh, or if you can just keep them there the whole mm -hmm. time, really. Uh, always having something to provide them is what I go for. But yeah, trumpet vine, passion, star jasmine, and there are some native clematis varieties that uh, I always reserve a spot for. And that, as long as you're planting for diversity, you're gonna have those seasonal blooms. You're gonna, if you're planting for diversity, it just works that you're gonna have early, mid, and late bloomers. Um, the other things that you can start experimenting with is some of our native burying plants. So the yopon um, is a great one. It's gonna bury in the winter and it's gonna be a great food source for birds and mammals. Um, but yeah, you've got, a lot of, you've got a lot of options. But again, if you're planting for diversity, bloom time is kind of built into that and you're gonna get that staggered effect. The jessamine, yeah. <laughs> they are adapted. So the question was, is the Carolina jessamine, is that native? That is an adapted plant. Um, still great. It definitely serves a purpose, um, but it is an adapted. Sure. Um, again, I'm very lazy. I don't. <laughs> um, I and also because I am planting plants that I want to come back every year. I'm going to let all of my flowers go to seed. So, and sorry, the question was when to cut some of these blooms back. Some plants really prefer to be deadheaded to spit out new flowers. Honestly, that's not going to be necessarily a native plant. Um, our native plants don't require maintenance for the most part. Um, and if you want to create that seed bank, you really need to let them go to seed so that they can drop that seed and then next year you get an even bigger show. Um, do what you want. If the flower's dead and it bothers you, cut it off. Let another one go to seed, something like that. Or you could do one in your, your garden that you kind of keep really nice and pretty. Put one in your sacrificial garden that you just let do whatever it does. Um, so that might be kind of a, a compromise between having a very maintained space versus a very natural space. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, if you're using a mycelized fertilizer, how important is uh, soil prep when you're planting a native so, so Soil prep is always important. Um, I will, and I'm sure I've said this to many of y'all before, I will take that $1 plant and I will put it in the $40 soil. If I'm starting with, you know, nutritionally deficient soil or something that's just not, not real high quality, I'm kind of setting myself up for failure. Um, if I'm planting in the ground, again, I think most of us probably have these really heavy clay soils. Just amending that with compost regularly will help loosen that up. Um, but yeah, soil prep is always important regardless of what you're doing. 
Um, so the more um, active that microbiome is down there, the healthier your plants are going to be just in general. Uh, it's like a bad foundation on a house. You know, if you've got a bad foundation, your house probably isn't going to stand very long. Um, same thing with plants. If we're starting with um, a bad foundation, then we're just going to see problems. Uh huh. Okay, so when I'm doing in-ground amendments, my kind of rule of thumb is half native soil, half compost. I use my wheelbarrow. So I just dig out whatever I need to dig out, throw it in my wheelbarrow. I add roughly, maybe a little less, the same amount compost. And this is especially for like very brand new beds that has never been amended before. That 50-50 really gets you ahead of the game. So then, so when you're planting something like this, you're going to want to go as deep as it is currently planted and twice as wide. So that's what I would dig out. I would dig something this deep, twice as wide. Um, I'm going to put all of that in my wheelbarrow. I'm then going to throw a bunch of compost in there. I'm going to mix it all together, and then I'm going to backfill when I go to actually plant this with that mixture that I've just made. Sir. Okay. Who has actually an article in today's New York Times on this beautiful and terrifying arrival of an early spring. Oh, yeah. Um, she writes regularly, so uh, on and environment. Sure. We are seeing, we're seeing New Year's every year. Um, I would like to be optimistic and say that it will stabilize. Um, I can't really say that with much confidence. I mean, our spring, we were 90 degrees in February. Not a great sign. Um, you know, we had a, a really mild winter comparatively. Um, I'm a little nervous about what summer's gonna be like, especially after last summer and how hard it was. Um, I have a feeling that we're all just going to have to be adapting and readapting every year. Plants too. We have a much easier time of that. Um, sure. There always will be. Absolutely. This class may be totally different next spring. You know, I may be talking about totally different things next spring. I probably will be. Um, again, just the. The lack of stability in our weather is, it should be concerning um, to everyone who's paying attention. And, and we just kind of have to adapt. Again, it's much easier for us to adapt than it is for insects, birds, mammals, anything out there that's trying to live in the, the wild is hard, y'all. It's hard. Um, most species, if they live to one year, they are lucky. They're in birds. I think the statistics on them is 18% of birds live to their first birthday. 18%, y'all. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. And with the weather changes that we're seeing, it's getting harder and harder. I started getting, so kind of side note, squirrels have two breeding seasons, one in the spring, one in the fall. Um, I was getting baby squirrel calls a full month earlier than I ever have. And I've been doing this for going on 10 years. So it's, it's hard. We just got to do what we can and support our ecosystem in whatever way we can. Sure. So this, this will all be on Facebook. So go yeah. Lastly, uh, class yes, the soil prep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. All of our classes are on online, so you can always go back and watch them. Um, I think our first one was soil prep um, for spring plantings, and the second, this is only our third class this season. Um, our second one was the importance of soil in general and how to make it, make it better for everybody.
Yep, so by all means, peruse, have fun. Yeah, oh, it was pruning. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and that was kind of maybe like spring, yeah. winter cleanup, spring prep. Um, yeah. So by all means, use our resources. Our website is chock full of blogs and tips and tricks. Please take advantage of it. We put that there for y'all. Hands down. It's all for y'all. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks for letting me nerd out. We love, love, love having you all here. And this is by far one of the fullest pollinator classes we've ever had. I am so thrilled. Nice. So thrilled. Um, Greg has coupons for everybody. So don't leave this room without it. Go have fun. Buy some flowers. Um, and don't hesitate to reach out with any questions whatsoever, OK? Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, let's do it. Look at all your pretty sketches. Oh, well, you could have told me it was yours, and I would have never known. There you are. And there you are. Super invasive. If you can get rid of it, get rid of it. I have one that I've been trying to kill for the last five years. I have, like, um, they, there was two or three, um, but it'll be in, gotcha. it'll be okay. in with all of okay. the online as well. Thank you. You're welcome. But you're welcome. I have two, but I want to use the camera. I'm going to get a rain barrel and kind of cover up rain barrel. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And that stuff is awesome. But it's starting to thin out. Like, so, and all the new growth is at the top.